Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another installment of LA Guitar Hang. And tonight we have a great local jazz guitar player in the LA scene. He's been here for a long, long time. Uh, Mr. Steve Cotter. How's it going, man? It's going good. Dwayne, thanks for asking me. Oh, man, it's an honor to have you, dude. It's uh, I've known Steve quite a long time and haven't seen him much lately. But uh, I, I think I asked you a while ago and, it, you know, things got sidetracked or whatever. But it's good to have you now. And I appreciate you doing it, man. It's awesome. Yeah, you and I go way back, back to Steamer's days. You Poland. know what's funny? When you bring that up, I wanted to talk about that because when... I was, I don't take my glasses off. I don't need them now. Um, when I was visiting out here, when I was thinking of moving out here, my in-laws lived in Orange County, uh, Fountain Valley, and I had gone to steamers a lot because it was somewhat close. And one of the times that I went there, you were playing. And I was like checking out the scene. And, and uh, I think it was like, I did a couple of trips because since they lived out here, we had visited every year. And it was one of the earlier trips where I didn't hang out in LA much, but I just went to steamers because they said, oh, there's a jazz club in Orange County. And I went there and you were playing and I was like, oh, man, this guy sounds great. And, it, you know, I was like really encouraged by the scene. I'm like, oh, this is great. You know, it's a cool little scene. This is a great player here. And it was it was a lot of fun. So I think you're one of the first guys I met before I moved out here. Yeah. And one of the other people that I met and we lost him last year was Barry's Zweig. Yeah. Barry was, for those of you who don't know, Barry was a, uh, you know, um, a total um, veteran on the LA scene. He had been here for years and years. And I actually took a lesson with him just to try to get to meet people. And he's the sweetest guy in the world and great player. And he, unfortunately, did he pass away in 2020 or was it 19? I think it was 19 and yeah, he was a very generous person. Yeah. yeah. Very Great sweet guy. And yeah. Extremely positive. Yep. So. Yeah. He was always the kind of guy who would give you a hug when you see him and, you know, just a nice guy. Yeah. He once, uh, I think once I, I, uh, you know, had an ac accident, didn't have a car for a while and he actually drove me around to do errands. Really? Yeah, he like he said, "Do you need a ride anywhere?" And I said, "Sure." And we spent we spent the day together. And um, nice yeah, guy, and, man. Yeah, I'll also say one other thing about him. I went I went to his place, and when I studied, um, I used to study out of the uh, the box sonatas and partitas for violin. Mm -hmm. And um, and I kind of you know did it in school and didn't think much of it. And I remember he had the B minor Courant sitting on his music stand. And he played through it. And I just like, it resonated so much. I pulled the book out and started going for it. And it was really that like experience that he yeah. was doing that. He was this, you know, he, he worked on stuff like that, you know? Yeah. You never know it, but, uh, unless well, you went that, to that's part of the repertoire of the jazz guitar plectrum world, because you can play that stuff with a pick because I know you've studied some classical guitar and, you know, a lot of the Bach music really is for a classical guitarist, but those partitas can be played with a pick. Yes. And I played them for years and, and sometimes I, I get back into them and every time I do for like a week or two, I'm, I it just, I suck so bad at it. I just give up at it. I go, ah, oh, fuck, this is too hard, <laughs> you know? Cause it's like, you gotta be on those things every day or just not, it's not gonna happen. Yeah, they, it's certainly like after a few days of them, the, the, uh, everything seems to move in the way that it, it should, but yeah, yeah. At first, like the first, after some time, it can be a little daunting at first. Yeah. 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 I like your, uh, blue train poster, man. That's a classic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got a little glare on it, but yeah, it's, it's a nice spot, you know, so <laughs> cool, man. Nice spot in the yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you about like where you grew up and everything. And I already know that because we've talked about it. And I think it's really funny. Um, I live in Huntington Beach and Steve, where his childhood home is in my neighborhood, like five blocks or something in my neighborhood, which is pretty funny. And I sent you a picture of that. I don't know if you remember that, like uh, last year, maybe I was out running. And I remember you told me like, 
I forgot if you told me the address, but you said there was a garden on Groton. I'm, I'm running, I'm going, which house would have been Steve's house? And I was like, I think it's this one. And I took a picture and you told me that was the right one. Yeah, Beachside Middle. There's only three houses on that little strip, so. Yeah, yeah. The middle so you, you grew up in Huntington? Were you born here or did your family move here when you were little or how did that work out? Well, I was born in Inglewood. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and we lived there for a little while. We moved to Hawthorne. So I was born in the west side of LA. And mm -hmm. uh, when I was seven, we moved to Huntington Beach. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's where I went to, you know, I went to grade school right over the bridge when they used to have a school over there and went to Huntington Beach High School when I got to high school. My and, daughter goes there. Mm -hmm. And what was it like then? Because you said it was pretty gnarly back then, huh? You mean the neighborhood? Yeah, Huntington in general. Because I know I heard stories that Huntington was kind of rough back in the day. It's not now, but I mean, I don't, I don't know. That's right. Yeah, I think um, it was definitely like even in the neighborhood with the school that I was near, there were it was uh, you know some unsavory kids. Uh. <laughs> we definitely my my uh, you know it, it was a little rough for for us being new new people out there, but. Um, but uh, I, I went to a different school and it was a nice school. And then Huntington was all right. And, you know, there's always like the cliques, the metalheads and the punks. And I was a mod. So I was like listening to 60s music. Oh, yeah. Know? And that was really like my first guitar idol was like Paul Weller of the jam. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, and I was listening to the damned and the Sex Pistols and, and the Who and the Beatles. I was a from a real Beatles family. We love the Beatles. My oldest sister loved the Beatles. She played guitar. I used to watch her play G, C, D and those chords. And kind of that was my intro to playing and, and, and was, was her and she was taking lessons. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that was, um, that was kind of, you know, I don't know if it was really necessarily rough, but I know that um, at the time, I guess that was the mid eighties that, you know, punk was the the Huntington Beach punk scene was a uh, maybe a little threatening to some people. So yeah, I think there's stories. You know, I don't know if if they were what yeah. they how true those stories were, but I just hear about skinheads in Huntington Beach, which there's yeah. kind of that vibe now, <laughs> kind of, but not skinheads, but you know, right? Yeah, it's def it definitely. Um, definitely kind of a sheltered environment um, yeah you know uh as far as you know different races and things like that so it was it was a lot less um diverse maybe in those days yeah I, I don't know if it's very diverse now even compared yeah. to other areas you know um one thing that I noticed when I talk to uh, friends of mine that have grown up here like you have is it's really funny the differences in the musical tastes because most of the cats my age, your age, so forth, they really had a um, in, interest in punk music, like punk was huge in this area. But when I was a kid, nobody was into punk because I grew up in South Florida. And Florida is a whole other uh, wavelength of mentality, you know, and I, I never knew anything about punk as a kid because, you know, nowadays with the Internet, you can know about anything you want. But when I was a kid and with music, you kind of listen to what your friends were into. Right. You know what you what you were exposed to. And in, where I grew up, it was just all metal, you know, it was hair metal and you know, that kind of stuff. And just, I didn't know anyone that listened to punk. I mean, you might see one or two kids with a, with a Mohawk, but that was about it. And, and so it's just so funny because like I said, people like yourself, that punk was a big part of growing up. So I always find that interesting how the different parts of the United States is just different tastes, you know? So who knows? Yeah. We had a lot of clubs out here that catered to that music and to, mm -hmm into this mod scene that I was a part of. Um, so it was going on. There was that club called the Golden Bear that was- I was gonna ask you about that. Did you go there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went, I saw, I probably went there about three times. It would have, you know, I mean, I was pretty young at the time when it was around, I was in high school, but 
but I went and to it a closed camp. shortly after that, right? Yeah, they did. So who did you see there? I saw the Untouchables. I saw Berlin when they were a smaller band. They were great. And yeah. um, maybe I saw the Untouchables twice. I was a real fan of, of them at the time. Yeah. That might have been it. I feel like I saw something else there. I just can't remember. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. I, I um, besides being a jazz musician, I'm kind of like a closet folky, you know, and I watch all these documentaries lately that have been coming around about like Echo in the Canyon. And then there's the Laurel Canyon movie. It's all about the the folk scene and the the alt not alt rock, um, you know, the the singer songwriter scene in in L.A. in the '60s and '70s. And they always talk about the Golden Bear as being like kind of an important place. Like it was kind of like the troubadour of Orange County. And all those people eventually would play the Golden Bear. It's like, it must've been really cool around that time. It was yeah. just right there, you know? Pretty cool. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> it was cutting edge, cutting edge. Yeah. And you, and you got into guitar around what age? Well, I mean, I, I you know, I, uh, I liked it when, as I said, when I was growing up and, and, uh, you know, thought, it, uh, liked it at 11. So I, I got a guitar and some lessons at 11 and, you know, it didn't stick. And then mm -hmm. again at 14 and it didn't really stick. And, um, and it was really 17 that, that I kind of was playing guitar and just trying to strum and learn Beatles songs and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was the end of that period of high school where a friend of mine played, uh, Al Di Miola and Paco De Lucia playing Passion, Grace and Fire on, on Electric Rendezvous. It's a do, it was the duo version of them. Oh, and yeah, I, yeah. I flipped out, man. I couldn't believe it. I was listening to David Gilmore and Jimmy Page and Johnny Winters and, and I really loved that. I loved ex extended blues solos. But when I heard that, it was like, what are these scales? What are these notes? Are they, is that, I never thought it was possible to play that much on the guitar and even what that sounded like. So it really twisted my brain to hear it. And yeah, that was kind yeah. of the beginning of, of it was, was when I was about to turn 18. I think Aldi Miola was a big influence on a lot of younger players, like as I was into him too, like when I, I was into metal and all this, and then I got into jazz and he was one of the first, uh, you know, I got into fusion first because that's a good bridge, you know, and Al was definitely one of those guys because if you're in a metal, you know, and all that, like Eddie Van Halen and Randy Rhodes and you hear Al, it's just like, oh, that's just like metal. It's like shredding guitar, you know, <laughs> and because uh, he was definitely a shredder. And uh, yeah, so it's funny because a lot of the guys that I talked to, they got into Al Di Miola like first because he kind of wakes you up, right? It's like, what's this, you know? Yeah, it's something to understand. It's something that's kind of understandable and it's yeah. popular at the yeah. time for sure. So that was and, pretty heavy. And did you get into acoustic guitar or, or you were still kind of a rock player at that time? Actually, I like that you, that you asked that because I really loved the acoustic guitar music. And it was, um, I'll tell you what did it for me was that there were two things. There was Al, my friend was playing these recordings. He played me Herbie on acoustic piano. I thought, you know, I, I, the only Herbie I knew was Rocket because you know, he had an MTV video. Yeah, he, he had a video on MTV and back when MTV was videos. And um, and so I had a subscription to Guitar Player Magazine and there was uh, a column that Larry Coriel wrote and I always liked his columns, you know? I thought, what is this? And then he had this, he did, the, he wrote a song called Six Beats, Six Strings and the album was called Together with Emily Remler and it was a duo record and I, played through the chords because it had tablature and I could possibly read that. And I thought these chords are really interesting. I've got to hear this. So I bought the record and man, that record became like a staple. And I, um, and I got into like Larry Coriel, really, real heavy, uh, you know, bought all the fusion records and the jazz records that he did and, and McLaughlin. And those were the guys I kind of got into and Chick Corea. 
Mm -hmm. But Emily Remler was real, like a great player. And I transcribed three of her solos off that record, like mm -hmm. in the next couple of years. And I met Corey Allen, took a lesson from him. And, and, but the acoustic guitar thing, like, that's what I was trying to, I was trying to play that, like some of those duos with friends, like Mediterranean mm -hmm. Sundance in Spain, of course. And um, that's where it kind of first started was with that. So it's through the acoustic and then, and then was Emily kind of the bridge to get into straight ahead jazz guitar? Because I know she was like a West disciple pretty much. Yeah. My friend actually gave me this friend who he, you know, what a, what a guy, you know, it's funny how it wasn't through my parents. Some people get it through their parents. Um, yeah. I got it through my friend who was a senior in high school and loved sophisticated music and all kinds of interesting music. And yeah. so he actually gave me, I remember he gave me a bunch of his records. So I had, um, so Emily was a big one and I knew she listened to Pat Martino and Wes and he mm -hmm. gave me uh, a Pat Martino record exit. And that was, you know, mm, I was listening killing. to that. So I was in to, I started getting more into the straight ahead. And at that time I was taking classes at Orange Coast College and I, and I started um, learning standards in the improv class and uh, he had us transposing and I was just off and running with it, you know? So mm -hmm. once he had us transposing, it was like, how am I, how am I going to survive in this class? You know, I got to find a way not to think intervals with this. I started, you know, I'm taking theory at the time. So I learned about functions and about borrowed chords. And I started understanding how to relate the classical theory to jazz theory. And then I, I could play tunes in various keys through that practice. So um, all that was happening at the same time, transcribing that, taking lessons yeah. from the guy. Um, this guy, do you know Dave Murdy? I've heard of him. Yeah, he's I been around a long time. Yeah, he took less. He was my teacher at Orange Coast College. Okay, and so he taught me about playing on two and four, and I started. Playing. I was playing a Gibson Les Paul. <laughs> that's what I. Mm -hmm. That's what I played after. Um, I, you know, once I got that guitar, I started playing that. So, um, so that was, that was kind of, what was happening at the time. So you were studying because you had said you'd taken a few lessons before and it kind of nothing panned out. So now you had a, a, a person that you really connected to and you really felt like you're moving forward at that point. Yeah, I I, I actually had a few teachers. Um, mm -hmm. I studied with this guy named Andre in like Moody's Music and Garden Grove. And he taught me like long lines over like Mixolydian lines and like they were oh, yeah. chromatics and everything. So I'd learned these lines that he gave me. And then I had studied with a guy who was kind of a friend of the family and he introduced me to like Keith Jarrett and Archie Shep Whoa. and stuff like that. And, and he would teach me things and, and show me, Hey, count the rhythms that are in Charlie Parker's scrapple from the apple. Let's, let's look at the rhythms here things like that. And um, so I was getting exposure to it and he would say things like here, just play a solo on the, on this part of the fretboard on the top three strings, impossible, you know, I can't even, yeah. can't even, I mean, just very interesting things and being exposed. And then Dave was um, a guy that I got to take through the school on a weekly basis. And it was, um, he was, uh, I, it's funny, I called him recently because, or I texted him and I showed him a picture of something that he wrote and he'd write these lesson plans and they were really good. Like he wrote them out and I found one the other day and, mm -hmm. um, just saw what he asked, what he asked of me. And um, so, yeah, I was having that experience. So he was very organized then, right? Yeah, he was, he was organized. Yeah. And he, had, and he had all kinds of fun tunes that he liked to play. And I was learning a lot of songs. So, yeah, so that was cool. All that. Yeah, that's cool. And then were you also like, were you starting a gig at this time playing in bands and things like that? No, I, I didn't gig at all. I, I about like I was playing in the improv class, I was playing in the big band. I was uh, I met some guys in the in the improv class and I went over and I played twice a week with them in like a trio way. Mm -hmm. So I was playing tunes in that way. Um, and then I was getting together with other guitar players and playing that acoustic stuff. 
mm -hmm. um, like duets with them. So, you know, I do the little recitals at the school, like performing, but no, it was all, it was all, I don't think I really played my first gig until I was 22. Wow. Yeah. Like well, I kinda, you, yeah. you gigged a lot after that. So you made up for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's big. It's become the focal point of what I like to do is make music on in a life. Sure. And then you went to North Texas. Yeah. Great school. I'd, I'd love that to, like, I'd love to, before I talk about, I'd love to talk, tell you about this, this Larry Coriel lesson I took. Tell me. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. yeah so Larry's like, a legend. That's like going back to 88. I went to Texas in 90. So I'm like 87 to 90. I'm, I'm at, um, Orange Coast College and, and I go up to Catalina's to see Larry play and I'm like, you know, really, you know, really into Larry at the time. And, um, and he comes out and I'm the only one there with the person that I came with. And he says, Oh, Hey, how'd you like the show? And I said, can I take a lesson with you? And then, um, so he gave me his number and I ended up coming up and taking this, this two hour lesson with him. And we're sitting down and I want to play Donnelly. That's what I want to play with him. So we're playing Donnelly and he teaches me how to play the head. Oh, you should finger this and finger this. And then he says, okay, now take a solo. And then he take, he, I take like eight bars and he stops me and he says, okay, you don't have any idea what jazz is about. And, um, and he said, I, um, he said, don't, don't be discouraged. I, you know, I played exactly like you when I started, but, um, you know, it's not a, he asked me what I practiced. I said, well, I practiced scales. I was doing them like eight hours a day, like scales. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. I had this whole kind of ordered practice that I did. And I did it the same way every day. And uh, maybe five, you know, maybe I got up to five hours or eight hours, something like that. But it was running through all these arpeggios and scale fingerings. And he, he explained it, you know, he talked about the history and about the reason why this music was invented who invented it and um and that it was really something that you that you would sing and that when you're playing something like donnelly you got to play things that are in that kind of language and he said here and he played the solo with his thumb and it was this simple solo and it was so great it was mm -hmm. such a great solo so beautiful and it, that was kind of my start to like to like get into the music and try to get into the music. So then the transcriptions kind of started coming and um, getting into that. So he was, uh, that was an inspiring lesson. And he actually kept in touch a little bit and uh, invited me to a couple of his shows. And, and uh, yeah, he was, a, he was a real supportive person like that for that short time. What do you think he meant? Like, do you, did he say like were you not addressing the changes properly and is that kind of like what he was looking for or the bebop vocabulary or oh, i tell you a couple of things well, for one thing i played vibra <laughs> i did that i did that for a long time so i'd be doing the vibrato and then um and so he said don't do vibrato that's what he said, uh, he said yeah. you don't want to no. and so okay so i cut that out and then he it was pretty much what I was playing. It sat, he said it sounded like I'm playing a ballad mm -hmm. and while we're playing swing and I'm playing scales over, there's no vocabulary. Right, so right. Everything that I was playing was like, it might've been the right scale for the change, but it really wasn't the music. And um, I didn't understand what that was at the time until probably in the last 10 years what a, what that really means yeah you know, to embody the actual music and take the melodies of the swing and the bebop era and actually that becomes the part of the music this music takes forever dude <laughs> it, does. it just takes forever to get good at. i have students that like i'll teach and they'll they'll be learning this stuff and they're doing really well especially adults and and they'll just say ah oh, i sound terrible blah, blah. and i go i go dude you just have to understand it takes forever it takes years to get good at this there's nothing else i can tell you you know it just takes forever <laughs> you know absolutely just yeah to be natural and to have it flow and to speak without even like all the all the great 
greatest players would say, you have to learn it all and then forget about it when you play. And it's like, well, mm. how do you do that? How do right. you do that when you really haven't learned it? You know, I mean. And but, that's the thing is most people coming up, they're thinking a lot. They're thinking too much. And it's because they don't know their instrument well enough. And I tell them, I go, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. It's like, yeah, because you don't know your scales, your arpeggios well enough so that you don't have to think about it. That's the whole point when we're improvising is to not think of anything. We just play what we're hearing in our head, you know? But man, you have to learn the neck really well to do that or have an insanely good ear, which not many people have, you know? Yeah, I, it's in the experience, it's all a develop, it's a process, it's all developed. Yeah. It's just an ongoing process. And it, and yeah. it uncovers and it's like a sculptor who starts off with a rock and they just fine tune it and they take sandpaper and they're just doing, you know, it's, it just becomes clearer and clearer mm -hmm. as we do it. And it's, you know, the longevity is really the, it's like sticking with it. Yeah. Never stopping. <laughs> Always That's doing the thing. It. You can't give up. It just gets better and better. And obviously you probably agree. You really start getting it when the gigs happen that's when it starts coming into, you know, into view more, more so when you're, when you're gigging as opposed to playing in your room, because you got to play in your room, but it's the gigs that crystallizes everything to me, you know? Yeah. Now, you. so you went to, after that, then you went to North Texas and, and, and who are, I know there's a, it's a very popular program. Who is the guitarist that you study with there? I studied uh, with Fred Hamilton. He was okay. my teacher. I mean, when I first got there, they had us doing classical guitar lessons. So I studied with a great classical guitarist named Stanley Yates, and um, he teaches at Austin Pay. I think mm -hmm. that's what this school is called. Um, and uh, yeah, he was great. So I studied with him for three years. And in that third year, I started studying with Fred privately. They started integrating jazz guitar into the program there were really not you you didn't take jazz guitar private lessons at the program. really the class it's a big jazz school they just didn't have a teacher is that what it was they had a teacher but that was just not how the program was laid out but fred got it to happen so mm. he, brought, he brought it in yeah and what did he have you do like transcribing technique the usual yeah. stuff yeah solo pieces transcribing sonatas and partitas by bach a lot of it was like finger. He he played fingers and pick. I tried that for a while, and I just said, you know, I'm just going to go all finger style, or I'm going to use a pick. And mm -hmm. I tried it, and uh, it, you know, it takes a lot of work. I wasn't the real practicer on those things until later, but he's planted the seed for sure, mm -hmm. and he and he introduced a lot of um, guitar players. I think I got into Jim Hall and those kinds of things people um all those great musicians through through him he introduced me to some really good things he was an interesting teacher because i don't think i ever i i think there's a little bit that rubbed off on me about his actual playing but my style was never like you know i've had other teachers like ron eshte where i where i uh, actually got into the actual style like where I would emulate some things that that he would do. But Fred was this had this real open kind of he this is no comparison. I'm just saying it was a it was a different kind of of teaching and thinking and things that I didn't even think about. Like he would say, you know, you you kind of play like you're boxed in. You should try you know try to stretch it out. And I didn't understand what that was at the time. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh we're in this bar, we're gonna play this set of <laughs> We're going to play this information in this bar and we're going to switch in the next bar and all the kinds of things he was talking about uh i think really come with with stretching our minds in this music mm -hmm. but he so he was really he was a great great spirit and, Just, and he didn't lock you into like a certain style or way of thinking he kind of like pushed you with whatever you were doing and saying, try this, try this, try this type of situation. Yeah. That's yeah. He would do that. And he, um, he let it happen. Yeah. Yeah. 
he didn't make it he didn't really choose the things so much he just kind of let let you you know and i was into it and i would go to him for questions and i was an inquisitive student somewhat and you were you know you were talking about pat martino earlier and all that but i'm assuming at this point you you know you got into jim hall and you're starting to go back now you're listening to west you're listening to maybe you, I, you told me you really like Jimmy Rainey. So like you were kind of checking those guys out at this point. Yeah, he introduced me to Jimmy Rainey. He played me the Stan Getz Jimmy Rainey on Parker 51. Oh so man. The first time funny. I ever heard it was, was he played it in his, in his office for me. And yeah. yeah, so there was Jimmy Rainey and he introduced me to J John Stoll. You know John Stoll? Sure. I need to yeah. check him out more. He's great, man. He had a great... Um, demo of him. So yeah, all of that was, it was a real good breeding ground to learn over yeah. there, along with the, the traditional elements of the school and the, you know, the reading that they have you do over there and the, the ensembles. It was all, it was a really good school and it was affordable too, which was good. What, what big city is that near? I don't know that, I don't know where that's at. It's, it's kind of like a triangle. You have Denton and then you have Fort Worth and um, and Dallas. Okay, yeah. and were you gigging a little bit when you were in school at all, or? Yeah, I lived with a for a summer. I lived with a piano player, and he um, he had this this steady gig, and he. I'm just pouring some coffee for myself. Oh, that's cool because it's nine forty five at night, <laughs> <laughs> and we're. And we'll keep you up. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just play you're, some after, I guess. Yeah, you're seeing me drink, so you're you're drinking as well. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, I got. So um, you start track. gigging. So it seems like because what you were saying when you're in California, you weren't gigging. You're more of a student. Now you're in school over there. Maybe now the gigs are starting to pick up. You're starting to get some um, real world experience yeah. as well. Yes. Yeah, so I, I had a, a six month gig every week playing with a, a quartet. That was great. That cool. was great. And, and when the piano piano player was great, uh, he was I'm just I loved playing with this guy. His name's Steve Snyder. He was so good. And um, and he liked Winton Kelly and all those kinds of things. It was a lot mm -hmm. of fun to play with. And there was a drummer that liked Philly Joe. So I, I like that was fun. And um, and then I was um, I gigged with a, with a vocalist who got a lot of gigs. And um, so I was playing with her and I was, um, yeah, and playing with, uh, you know, I was in the, in the band, that top band over there. So we were doing some gigs and then I was gigging with some other people. So, yeah, there was a bit and it and it was uh, it was plenty at that time. For sure. That's good. So everything starts coming together and then eventually you come back home to California. Did you, did you think of going to New York or you just wanted to come back to California? I did. I thought I was going to go to New York. Yeah, uh -huh. I did. And, um, so I, I moved back here and I stayed in Huntington beach for a bit and I met, um, some really good players, you know, like Matt Otto and Danton Bowler. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know Danton, but anyway, he I don't moved know to him. I know Matt though. Yeah. They all moved to New York. All the guys I met. And so I stayed and I started playing with um, some, you know, I, I got a gig with Bobby Caldwell and I started playing with him in 97. So I just mm. kind of, you know, and I was, I had the citrus job a little bit, you know, it was like some things were happening and I was playing gigs with people and I was kind of just digging it. Mm -hmm. and, and I played, I, I think my fun, one of my funnest, like enjoyable times was, you know, 96 in Huntington Beach playing uh, four gigs a week with sax players <laughs> Just play, playing tunes and learning joe henderson i couldn't play modal tunes that well at that time so it was like it was all really you know got i felt like i got my ass kicked pretty well and it was a, it was fun were you gigging in huntington or was it more la i i was gigging in huntington and then there were some guys who were playing up in LA and so I, there was like a, a band or two that I got to play with and some of the good clubs. And I was going up to LA to the jam sessions up there at weekly. Yeah. So I, I was hitting things for about a year, like yeah. hitting the, this, 
yeah, this Burbank jam, jam session that um, some older. Is that Jax? No, it was actually Chadney's. Okay. And Chadney's is great because it had, um, there were a lot of really seasoned players who played there and there were um, guys from Cal Arts and Jamie Rosen. I met Jamie Rosen there. He was playing. Mm. Yeah. He would sit in and we'd all sit in over there and, and, uh, and it was, it was really great to be around yeah. the guys who, um, had been, you know, who worked in the, in, um, you know, like on the tonight show and then, and then guys who had been on, you know, records for years and Earl Palmer was the, was the drummer over mm -hmm. there. And, and there was, uh, a guy named George Gaffney and just different people who had, who had played. And I, Teddy Edwards sat in and Bobby Durham sat in and Jay Canna sat in and sometimes wow. we get to play with people like that. And so it was thrilling at that time. And then, um, and then fifth street Dicks and world stage were going. So I'd be going there every week and I started doing, some like Willie Jones was around. So I got to play a little bit with him and with some of those guys. And it was a good, good time. And steamers was happening. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's how it goes. You know, you start going to jams, you meet people, they call you for gigs, you get more gigs and it just grows and grows. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, it grows and grows. That's yeah. what happens. And then, and then you stop working with this guy and you're working with this guy and it just right like, right it, it it keeps going yeah and when did you move into la because i know you live there now i think right i mean you've been there a long time 97 97 okay and did you kind of gig more when you moved to la did it help help your with the visibility and all that kind of yeah. stuff yeah i i lived with a, a sax player who was playing a lot so that was cool Mm -hmm. And uh, not that we played a lot out a lot together, but he asked me to do some things. And and then I was playing with Bobby Caldwell. So that was happening. Mm -hmm. And there was some activity with action with that. And then there were some, you know, playing some of the clubs up in L.A. And uh, yeah, it was it was going and it wasn't necessarily easy. Mm hmm you know it's never easy <laughs> you know, it wasn't easy for about um it got easy about eight years later <laughs> <laughs> like it got pretty real easy financially it would yeah but, but for those times it where it was a lot of playing just playing with people and doing whatever and going down to orange county and there was a big band in orange county the don miller orchestra and i used to play with them a lot so there were gigs down there and gigs up here yeah it was wild like when when i first moved here i, I moved here like 2001 and it was i told this story before but you know i had the mindset because i had always been a guitar teacher and i always gig too but like my main income was teaching right and my thing in my mind was like okay when i moved to california i'm probably not going to gig for a while so i'm going to focus on teaching first and the gigs will come later but it was like the opposite for some reason in Huntington and Costa Mesa and the whole area, there was like a lot of gigs. And within the first couple months of being here, I had four steadies a week. And I yeah, was like, holy shit. I couldn't believe it. You know, I remember that you were working a lot and it was crazy. And it was just, I, I was shocked because I didn't think that I was going to gig. You know, I thought like I was going to have to pay my dues, which I still pay dues, but and that was when I was able to meet all the cats because when you know how it is in this town, if you have gigs, you can call pretty much whoever you want. You know, if the gig pays decently, you can kind of call whoever and most cats are cool and they'll just play. And that's when I started to play with Bag and Joe Bag and, you know, Harnell and whoever would play with me, you know, bass players here and there. Yeah, and, I mean, you say Joe Bag and it was, uh, you know, we what a great friend he turned out to be. Yeah, you know, all those guys. I mean, you all know, those years. He he was out here and a nice reason to be in LA. Yeah. Sure. And then when you started gigging, did you kind of at that point, since you were doing well and everything was did you kind of just say, I oh, forget New York, I'll just gonna stay here or or like how did that work out? Yeah. 
pretty much. You yeah. know, I started playing, uh, you know, I was playing with Tyrell and some with Joey and it's just comfortable out here. Yeah. It's nice out here, man. I did New York for a summer. I, it wasn't for me, you know, everyone's different, you know, um, I'm a warm weather beach guy. You know, I grew up in Miami and, and New York was, I love New York. I go back as much as possible and I'm ready to go back. But man, living there is different than visiting. You know, a lot of people go there and they're going to the Vanguard every night and it's it's amazing. But man, everyone that I knew there had like three jobs and nobody was making any money and it was like, it was pretty brutal. So I quickly figured out like, this is not for me, you know? Yeah, the um, amount of income to have, like the savings to have to go there um, would have been, you know, I, I didn't have that kind of... Um, money to go and get a place and have some you know yeah um but you know i did i did make i made a trip i remember going out there for 10 days you know with my friend joe and and uh and met peter bernstein out there and those mm. guys and it was a very inspiring place and then got to go with with tyrell got to go out with him and stay out in new york as much as nine weeks once wow and and uh work and and be in the in the city and yeah. um yeah and when this is all over i'd love to take a trip out there and just go to a club i'm yeah. overdue to go back man i'm dying to go back but definitely i want to wait till this covid thing is over i want to get my vaccination and all that stuff and then i'm i'm gonna go back you know the Tyrell gig, how did that happen? Because he's a you know a major singer and he does a lot of things. And you've been how long have you been with him for? Uh, well, I haven't played with him for a while. Um, uh, it's been a, a few years, um, but I played with him first in '02, and I actually met him because I was playing with a sax player that I met in OC, um, a guy named Dan Saint Marseille. I don't know if you remember him. Yeah, I used to work with him at OSHA. Yeah, yeah. Man, he's a good guy. Yeah, great guy. And and uh, so he was friends with William Claxton and and Tyrell was friends with William Claxton and mm -hmm. did a thing up at, uh, I guess they call it the House Tashins. It's like, it looks like a Jetson's house up up Floral Canyon. Yeah, take Whoa. a little shuttle. And so I, I got done with the gig and I was going down to the shuttle and he was right there. And uh, it was 98 and he said, Hey, you're the guitar player. Why you sound, you sound good. And, and he liked me and, and I was working with somebody else and it, we didn't really hook up then, but then another friend asked me to, uh, you know, it just seemed like there was always this gravitation towards it. And one day they said, Hey, you know, would you come down here and, uh, and try out because uh, our guitar player is not working out. And so I went there and um, I walked in and I saw him and I said, hey, uh, Steve, we met this one time. And he went, oh, great. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Welcome. You know, and that was really it. And I, I just subbed for a while. And then the guitar player, they ended up uh, needing a guitar player. And I, they asked if I wanted to join the band in 05. And we went to Russia and, and I just started wow. play, playing with him and those, uh, those, it was really like those five or six years, uh, from those, that period I was playing a lot, um, with him. You toured the world yeah. pretty much, right? We did. We went to Europe and to Japan, Singapore, Korea, uh, Philippines, Russia, like I said, and that's yeah, great, man. In New York and, you know, all kinds of neat. He has a, um, the guy who arranged, who's done some of the playing. Um, so, but I got, you know, I really got to go to a lot of places with him and, mm -hmm. uh, and to be out for a month and things like that. And so that's all I really, that's really what I wanted to do. And, you know, to do the tour. touring thing. Yeah. I never did that, man. I, 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 I want to. But with me, like I was here a few years and I was, you know, gigging and doing my thing. And then, and then I had a kid, you know, and then once I had a kid, I just, I did not want to tour. I, I just, you know, I, I, I remember I had my kid, Isabel and a year, like when she was a year old, I, I got a gig playing with this R&B singer, Tania 
we were in New York for like a week. And it was great, man. I had so much fun, dude. And this is when like, I wasn't getting any sleep. <laughs> you know, my daughter was still up all night. So I got this gig and I was like, I gotta go. I was like, thank God I get to sleep every night, you know, by myself in the hotel room. And it was, it was just like, my poor wife was like, so I'm struggling, you know, but, yeah. but you know, she was great. My wife's great. And, 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 uh, but man, after like a week, I'm like, I'm dying without my kid here. You know, it's like, this is awful. I, and, I don't and the band leader was like, oh, you got to get over that, man. I never see my kids. And I was like, no, 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 no. That's not going to be me, dude. Yeah. You know? That's the thing. I couldn't really quite get how those guys could do it. Yeah. You know, to, uh, to be apart from a kid when, especially if it's a baby and it's starting to make those the progress that it makes on a daily basis. Yeah. I, that probably would have, if, if I had uh, got married, had a kid. Yeah. It, it would have changed probably a lot. Yeah. Well. And that's the thing is I never really, I mean, I had done, I had done, you know, a week here, a week there I have. And whenever I do it, I have a blast. I love it. I love playing. I love going somewhere new. And now that my daughter's in high school, I mean, she's a sweetheart we get along great but you know she doesn't want me around you know she's a teenager you know and eventually she'll go to college so i'm getting to that point now where it's like okay now i want to tour you know like i'm getting i want i, I want to do it and the good thing with jazz is you can be well, i don't even think of myself as being old but you know you can tour until you're 70 or 80 or whatever the hell so i'm at that point now where it's like okay now it's my turn i want to tour i want to go do the thing so, and then COVID hits, but you know, who knows? We'll see what happens, but I would love to, to do that. Cause I think it'd be, it's gotta be a blast, you know, seeing the world and going to different cities and playing, in, especially with something like with Tyrell, I'm sure he has great crowds and the turnouts probably, it's not like, uh, I'm assuming, you know, you're staying in nice places, you're making some nice bread, this and that. So it probably was a nice, uh, experience for you. Yeah, on top of it, the guys in the band and Tyrell were great to be around. It was yeah, a, nice people. Yeah, there were a lot of laughs, a lot of good times. And yeah. you get, and there's nothing like, a, well, that I can't say there's nothing like it, but for me, being with a band, being in new places and getting, like, the music gets tight and um, it's, it's a thrill. That's it that probably... Part. Yeah. The show gets like second nature, I would assume, right? It's like you just, it's just automatic. Yeah, it's an energy that gets turned on. And uh, that's, and I've gotten to do that with a couple different groups. And yeah, that's, that's good stuff <laughs> right there. And the Joey D. Francesco gig, how did that come about? Because I was going to tell you, um, whenever I do these interviews, you know, you and I have known each other for many years, but we never sat and talked for like an hour, you know? So I don't know that much about you. And I, I see that, you know, I knew I've seen you with Joey D and I'm a Joey D. I love Joey D and um, that album you did with him uh, for Rudy. And uh, man, I was listening to that earlier tonight and it's so good, dude. It just, it's classic Joey D just swinging the way it was recorded. It just sounds like a classic organ trio record and yep. you play great on there, man. You know, very lyrical. I've always felt that you're a very lyrical, very swinging player. That's what I really enjoy about your playing. And it's a great record and it has Ramon Banda. For those of you who don't know, Ramon is a, was a great jazz drummer in the LA scene. Uh, he was known as a Latin, you know, a percussionist and drummer, but man, he was a swinging jazz drummer. And I saw Joey D probably 10 times at Steamers and many of them had Ramon. And I think probably two or three of them, you were on guitar and uh, man, just Joey D was so great. And, and how did that happen? How, how did that come about? Well, that was Ramon. It was really hooked you up with it. I was playing with like I knew Ramon. I had met him because I, you know, I knew Francisco Torres who played with Poncho, and Ramon was playing with Poncho. So Francisco had me go over one time to play with 
him, him, he said, oh yeah, you know, yeah, he's in Pancho, but he likes Art Blakey, you know? So yeah, yeah. We, so we played and, uh, and I would be social with him. And then he started hiring Joe Bag and me to play some gigs. So we were playing gigs and then um, it came that Joey was going to play at, um, at Catalina's for a week. So I was, you know, I went and I played. And uh, Joey and I had played before uh, on some recording session with uh, actually Zane Musso was on it. You remember mm-hmm. Zane, right? Poor Zane, yeah, man. And uh, yeah, and uh, a couple other guys were on it. And uh, and he was really he was really nice. And and that was in I think two thousand or two thousand two. And then yeah, and then Ramon got me on that thing, and we did. Um, we did Catalina's and then he was, he had this whole kind of crowd of these, this whole Italian uh, crowd. And we, we uh, went and we played some club and in, in Beverly Hills and we had a good time. And then we ended up playing in a movie together that was uh, like one of Amy Adams first movies. And she was in the scene and it was basically a movie about, an, an accountant who is a closet jazz piano player and she's a singer who works in a club and Joey was in the movie and he, he plays the club owner. <laughs> really? And he's got a band that he plays and the band had uh, Joey, Ramon, Tony Bonda on bass and me. And what was the movie? It's called Moonlight Serenade. So. Okay, was, I've heard of that. Yeah, it was... Uh, you know, and we, we played and we recorded the music and, and Amy was at the, at the Amy, Amy Adams was, yeah. at, <laughs> she was at the studio and, and she was singing in it and, mm-hmm. and uh, it was a cool, it was a good, cool time. And uh, I just played with him at steamers and a couple of gigs here and there. And he got me, to, I got to play with him and Jimmy Smith with Ramon at Catalina's and we did a weekend like three nights and that was great. And uh, so it was great to be able to play with Jimmy Smith. So see- it was two organs and, and guitar and drums. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, there's a lot of love on that stage. <laughs> Those guys liked, he, they loved each other. They were, they were great. And, and it, Jimmy, was a, man. it was absolutely thrilling. And so then, um, yeah, some time passed and it wasn't really until about 2012 that he asked me to go to Europe and we started doing the uh, really two full years that led to that record. And, you know, I got to play with him and Jimmy Cobb once and, yeah. you know, because Coriel couldn't make the gig. So I didn't, I did like the first gig with them off of another gig that we were doing. And, and uh, yeah, it's for good times, you know. And, uh, Joey, uh, you know, I learned, you know, I had to, I kind of had to be schooled a bit, like, like, even though I had played so long, like just to know about the comping and giving space and, and letting him do his artistry. And, um, yeah, it was a good, lot of good stuff that, that went on and we, yeah, we went different places we're in a van across Italy and a lot of, a lot Was of he a trip. He seems like a trip, like kind of a funny guy. He's a funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to tease me a lot. Cause he's got me on the spot. Welcome back. <laughs> so. You know, you know, you know, I heard things about him. Like he's not that old, but he's I heard that he's younger an, than me. Yeah. I, but I heard he's an old school kind of guy where like, oh, yeah. he just starts playing a tune and you better know it. Like yeah. if you don't know it, that's your problem, right? He's Is that how he does it? Oh yeah, we were in, uh, we were on a gig, and and I love that because I I like you know I love being surprised, so that that's good. And he he, he popped out uh, Lush Life. Oof. I love Lush Life, so you know I I'm love Lush. I like you better it know it though. It. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I yeah, and so I learned tunes playing with him, but then yeah, he would do that sometimes, and and. You would play like the if if we if we had a run, he would 
sometimes the first night would be like a, a night of like trying stuff and then there would be kind of a, a set that would be invented. So uh, usually the first set is pretty much set and then the second set might be, there might be a little bit of play and um, and that's how that would go. And he wouldn't talk to you like, hey, learn this tune for tomorrow night or anything he like did, that? He actually. Or... He okay. called me once and he said, hey, uh, we're going to go, uh, we're going to, okay, on this trip, I, I want to do the Way Out West record. Let's do those. <laughs> Let's do all okay. the tunes on Way Out West. So we did a bunch of tunes on Way Out West. And, oh, uh, so he at least told you, because like I, like I said, like, because, you know, you know, when someone calls tunes like that, for me, I know that you have a reputation for being kind of a tune smith in town. Like, you know, a lot of tunes and there's different levels of that. Like for myself, I probably know about three or 400 tunes, which sounds like a lot, but it's really not much, you know, SJ probably knows two or three or 4,000 <laughs> or something like that. You know what I mean? So yeah. I know, you know, a lot of tunes. Um, and would, you know, what, what's challenging about that when you're on stage, it's like, for me, like I'll, I jam with records all the time. I can learn a tune very quickly by ear. Like I hear where all the changes go, but there's a difference between that and knowing the melody really well and knowing the form and not getting lost. And when you're on stage, it's like, oof, that's, <laughs> that's gonna be pretty stressful, you know? If you don't know the tune, especially Lush Life, Jesus, Lush Life is deep. You got to know that one inside now. Yeah, yeah, it has some spots that, um, that, for sure. And uh, but once it's learned, you know, you got it. Yeah, it's, it's like, like it's almost like anything, right? Yeah. I mean, once you know it, you can. It's like you start playing. It's like there's a you know there's a record being played, but that's after so much time if he if he called a tune that you didn't know i'm assuming he didn't expect you to play the melody like he would just play the melody and you would just right. follow him yeah there was he liked doing um oh man it was some ray charles tune like we did um you don't know me and i learned you don't know me by playing with him on stage yeah maybe we did it in the sound check sometimes yeah. sound check you can practice a song with those guys. And um, so there was that. And then there was like, maybe there was I'm a woman, which might have been a Ray Charles thing. Yeah. And uh, we had to do that. And so yeah, it was just but you know, like anything, even though the chords are there, when you got that kind of, when I can hear what he's playing and the kind of experience and like the depth of that music, uh, you know, me playing over G7 just doesn't sound like that <laughs> version of him playing. Oh, well, he's there's so he, there's just a music and melody and and the yeah. group, all that stuff is 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 coming up. So yeah, I might be able to survive and play something that's kind of cool over it. But yeah, he's, he's such a monster, man. Like he, he swings so hard, but he just can shred so fast and just bebop and whatever anything and um i remember one night we saw him at steamers and uh he was really winging i don't know if you were on the gig it might have, he, that jake leckley guy you play with him a lot too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. might have been jake i don't remember the night but it was so funny because joey d he was like ah oh, so uh what do you guys want to hear like you could tell he like he, <laughs> he was just winging it and some guy was like kind of being a smart ass and he goes mac the knife and he oh. goes, and he goes, all right. Oh, yeah. And, but he did it real slow. He's like, do, 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 do. and I swear to God, I was like floored because it was so, I think Ramon was on the gig, but it was like slow, but it was so grooving. And he had, I don't know what you would call that sound where the organ, where it's like sped up, where it's kind of a fast yeah. Leslie kind of a sound where it's yeah. kind of cheesy, but kind of cool in the same way. It's like, yeah, like that kind like, of thing. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Yeah, man. But it was slow. 
And it was insane. And he was trying to like bust the guy going, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it really slow. But it was, it was ridiculous, man. Like so swinging, just so good. And just like the, I was telling you the record I was listening to the, you know, him and Ramon, Ramon had that um, Elvin kind of thing with organ, you know, which, which is very rare. You don't hear a lot of guys play like that, but whenever he would play with Ramon and Joey D, there was just this, they were so hooked up together and it sounded so good. It you was know, cool, yeah. It was yeah. so good. And it reminded me of like the Larry Young Elvin vibe, you know, with Grant Green or something, you know. Yes. Right. And like and and it that's gotta be heaven to play over that <laughs> the two of those yeah. guys together. It's like wow. I mean, you probably had some amazing gigs doing that all those years, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. There were some uh yeah, just great, all kinds of great things to play. Have um, you, you know, every gig, and play a little bit of, of everything, a great ballad, a good blues, a good standard, something with lots of changes, something with no, hardly any a modal tune. Yeah, lots of fun. And one album that, you know, a lot of people don't talk about with Joey D, have you heard the McLaughlin album, After the Rain? I have it. It's, yeah, I listened it's, to some of it. Yeah, I, 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 I ha I'm not haven't gotten inside that record, but yeah, it's wild to hear Joey D play like that because you know McLaughlin, you don't normally, and I love John McLaughlin. I think he's incredible, but you don't hear him playing a lot of straight ahead. And on that record, he doesn't. I talked about this on another episode, but he's not like a swinging jazz guitar player, but man, he's doing his thing. And Elvin and Joey D together is just like, oh my God, it's so good. And Joey D is doing the modal McCoy thing, which he does amazingly well, but you don't hear him do that very often. At least I don't hear that. Like when he does his thing, you know, he's doing the more swinging thing, but man, on that record, it's like, it sounds like it's got a Coltrane vibe, which is what they were going for because they're doing Coltrane tunes and Wow, it's it's pretty cool. Did he do the the modal? You were saying modal. Does he get into the Coltrane thing when you would gig with him sometimes? Yeah, sometimes a couple, a few times. Yeah, I think pretty we wild. might have played Resolution or something Oof. like that. Yeah, wow. Times when it was like that. Yeah, he had that thing down, man. Yeah. And then okay, so nowadays you're you know we're all stuck in covid and you're we're all just getting by and you're teaching you're still at uh citrus is that correct yeah citrus at my house <laughs> yeah i'm doing a dual enrollment through citrus so i'm in the same boat you know everything's at the house you know and uh now i gotta talk guitars for a second because i'm, I'm a gear guy and you you had you have a, a beautiful L5. You had an accident when you lost one of your guitars, right? Is that true? I think you told me about that. Yeah, it was actually rebuilt. Really? So mm -hmm. now your L5 is a 70s L5? It's 80. 80, okay. 1980, yeah. And with that got damaged in the accident and then not who, that who one. rebuilt it, was... it? Oh, not that one. It was something different? It was a different guitar. It was a Gibson 775. Okay. And uh, yeah, guy uh, rebuilt it. He, he kept it for a few years and he put it back together and it was a mess. There was a lot missing on it, uh -huh. but it actually, it plays. It's, it used to be a blonde guitar. It's a different guitar. Uh -huh. You know, it's kind of different guitar now, but um but yeah i paid to have it repaired and it was kind of like a nice closure who did that this guy named ted mayer i don't know you know him. his son seth is a is a luthier ted's um kind of a, i mean you know we throw the word around but he's kind of a genius if he could put that together like a jigsaw puzzle. 
Well, that, as I was say, it's not an easy thing to do, man. That's Our stock did. guitars said, are like. Said, How'd you do it? He said, I laid it all out. And I just said, this piece goes here and this piece goes here. Wow. And that's what it was like. There was like, you know, small wood pieces. And it's like, what? who would ever do that? And he really, you know, he just, I paid for the paint. I mean, you know, and the, uh, maybe the gold to be, you know, just a couple things. I mean, you know, maybe I shouldn't be saying that, but he's, he was really generous and, you know, he just, he was very, very generous and to take that on. And then you have an L5 now, right? Yeah. And that's, is that what you used on the, the Joey D record? I did. Ruby? I did. It sounds like an L5 to me. Yeah. I, I brought it out. We did it at, um, Rudy Van Gelder's studio. Wow. That must and have been amazing. Inglewood Cliffs. Cliff. Yeah. Wow. Yes, it was. Wow. It was quite what, an experience. I'm a, he, I don't know if, has, I don't know when Rudy Van Gelder died, but I'm assuming he, he didn't engineer the record or did he? I don't know. He did. Oh, he did. Okay. So you get to work yeah, with Rudy. He has, no wonder. Cause it sounds yeah, so good. The production's amazing. Yeah, he, he did that. And I believe his wife uh, set up a lot of things too. Um, yeah. And uh, we were playing Budo on the record. And I thought, you know what? This sounds like Bar Wars. And he said, well, that was, and, and Joey said, that was recorded here. You know, Bar Wars, Willis no. Jackson with Pat Martino. I, wow. I know. I don't know that. I love Martino. Oh, the record's great. <laughs> it's 1976. Oh and, and it's, uh, it's it's great. It's so much fun to listen to, and it's Willis Jackson's record. It's Willis Jackson's record, and, and okay, and, uh, and uh, Martina just he's you know he's and he's a wonderful player in uh, in all times. But seventy six is one of my favorites. Nineteen seventy. I love Pat Martino, man. Yeah, the yeah early records and <sighs> yeah, and he did a lot of things with Willis Jackson back in the sixties. But anyway. Um, so that was kind of cool to know that that was the same place where that was recorded. And what amp did you use? Because it had a very warm tubey sound. It was a silver tone. I think it was a twin. Silver tone okay. twin. Okay. So is it? Yeah, because it had. It had, super, had... Like a super reverb and he had a, a twin. And I think I went with the, the twin. I think it was a twin. Yeah, man, it had a warm, classic kind of that L5 West sound that was just spot on. I really like your playing on the record. It sounds great, man. The the, the I, I, it's funny. So Rudy did because I, I remember listening to it, going, "God damn, this sounds like a classic jazz record." Just the production and the sound. It was just it's a beautiful sounding record. It really is, man. That, yeah, it was very. Um, it was a very comfortable recording situation mm -hmm. yeah and you had all the shout choruses kind of worked out that sounded really cool yeah he had that on one tunes. Ahmad Jamal uh thing that we did at the beginning and, yeah uh, so we, that that was maybe that and goodbye were the two that I remember that were maybe the most worked worked out ones and there was a lot of just kind of playing yeah and, Udo was kind of worked out, but, uh, yeah, it just kind of flew right by. That's how all records are. Just, it's like that, right? Real quick. Yeah. It took four hours to do and wow. And, uh, yeah, we were just sitting, like I was sitting next to him and, and, and the, uh, the drum booth was open so we could hear it coming through and almost didn't really need headphones. So. That's that's the way, man. All those old records are all just in a room, and it's natural, and it just sounds so beautiful. I, I listen to all those Blue Note records all the time, and it's just, it's man, it doesn't get better than that. That's that's the sound, you know. I, I just discovered a new one the other night. I, we'll wrap it up in a second. It's getting late, but uh, Lee Morgan, uh, the Procrastinator. You ever listen to that record? Yeah, I have that record. <sighs> wow, what a great record! I just discovered that the other night what a group man herbie and wayne and on carter yeah man billy higgins 
Like something else. Man, stop, start. Yeah, that's good record. Good stuff, man. Well, um, I want to thank you, dude, for doing this, man. I appreciate it. It was great talking to you, and and I got to learn a lot about your past, and you know, playing with Joey D and Steve Tyrell. Um, what are, are there any other records that? Because I want you know, whenever people listen to this, I always try to steer them towards things you're you're doing that that are recorded that one is out there are there any other records that you recommend that you've been on that people could check out if, if like on spotify or apple or whatever not necessarily i mean just real small records but i think that that the joey records probably that one's pretty much shows what it's i out there yeah 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 i'll put something out <laughs> You gotta do your own thing, man. I actually, yeah, I actually have something that that I've I've done, and it's just oh, okay. A, I'm getting it. Getting Who's on it? it? Uh, Mark Ferber, Ooh. Richard Sears, and Mike Garola. Oh man, that's gonna be a good record. Yeah, it's got a couple originals and a lot of songs that I like to play. And so. get that out there, man. I'm sure it sounds great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, man. Well, I, uh, I appreciate your time. It was, it was really cool talking to you and, and I got to, I feel like I, I know you better now than before because we got to get into your whole history and everything. And uh, hopefully when this thing's over, we've done a couple of gigs together and I really en always enjoyed playing with you and hopefully we can do it again soon when there's, you know, more safe gigs around. I'm with you and I'd love to do that. And I appreciate your positive energy and your you know friendship over the years oh man thank Absolutely. you yeah and and that we we have this thing that we love in common yeah which is a wonderful thing yeah, yeah man all right brother well um you know stay safe stay healthy and uh we'll see you around and uh thanks again for doing this man pleasure all right thank buddy you. we'll see you okay bye